evening, Chicago. My name is Charles Patton. I am the People's Counselor. I am sitting in for your community epidemiologist, Sister Yah Simpson. Unfortunately, she's, um, she won't be here, but the good thing is she's out doing some community engagement as an epidemiologist. So today we want to talk about, as we have over the last couple of shows, um, health equities. And basically what that means is that we are going to advocate for ourselves to get what we need to stay healthy. Now, I am a substance abuse counselor by trade, and I have always um, advocated or at least pushed people to try to make decisions. Though we know that in dealing with any health crisis, particularly with HIV, hypertension, diabetes, we know that um, a lot of our medical professionals tend to want to push uh, medications. But we have to take responsibility, as one of my colleagues always tell me, which basically means we must learn how to respond with ability. And it's been my understanding and my learning over the last few years uh, since I've been here on this earth that we are the knowledgeable or the most knowledgeable people that's what's going on with our bodies, with our health, within our world. So we need to make sure that we start to advocate and learn as much as we can to stay healthy. So with that being said, I am here representing TAX. We are the Association of Clinical Trial Services. And basically what that means is that we are advocating or at least trying to um, help oversee some of the clinical trials and get people more knowledgeable about clinical trials. Because if we don't get involved, then we will continue to get things that are not necessarily beneficial to us. You know, so we have to be advocates for ourselves once again and continue on a daily basis, on a minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year basis to continue to advocate for ourselves. We know that in this country, we are in a medical crisis, if you will. We know that pharmaceutical companies or pharmaceutical prices are skyrocketing. We know that um, getting access to adequate health care in some parts of the world and some parts of Chicago um, is, is difficult for some people. You know, and then a lot of times, myself included, when I go to see a physician, I rely on their knowledge because I have been to some school. I got some schooling, but I haven't did the work to get the uh, medical degrees, if you will, although my specialty is in substance abuse. You know, but I have worked with some physicians, and I am truly the advocate and the authority on what happens to my body. You know, and we take a lot of our medical professionals as being the gurus, if you will, you know, and a lot of us follow their recommendations, whether we feel good about it or not. I have had some experiences where I had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with my physician and say, look, I don't like the way this medication you prescribe to me is making me feel. I had one respond to me like, oh, well, you got to get adjusted to it. I don't want to get adjusted to it, and we need to be able to let them know that, okay? So with that being said, let me talk a little bit more about the um, tax and our health equity program. Okay? All right. Now, as you can see, this is tax, and we are, these are some of our supporting agents. Um, with diversity comes a cure. Increased diversity in clinical trials. Now, what does that mean, increasing diversity? Well, we need to get more people of color involved in clinical trials because unfortunately a lot of times the medications and the treatments that's being prescribed has been tried on other groups of people and they may not necessarily work for us. So we need to make sure that we try to increase the diversity, get involved in the process, and I hear a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to be a guinea pig. I don't either. <laughs> but I, wanted, I want the best optimal health possible. 
And we know that there's a lot of conditions out here that's affecting people of color, particularly, you know, and HIV is just one, you know, but we're also dealing with diabetes. We're dealing with hypertension, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and it's a host of other things out there um, that we as a group of people are dealing with. And from the literature and the data, people of color are being disproportionately impacted by some of these ailments. Okay, so we know that a lot of that, and we talk about the genetic factors, you know, but then a lot of times it's based on what we do. It's been my experience that um, in the program that I operate in, if to be aware is to be alive. You know, we know that knowledge is the key to being free from most social ills. You know, so the more you know, the more you can advocate for yourself. And if you ain't at the table, then you're getting what somebody else decides is what's better for you. So I encourage everybody to go and have a conversation with your physicians. And hopefully you're getting checkups regularly because we need to do that, um, particularly when we get to a certain age. And um, I would say, and you ain't having regular physical exams, then uh, you, we need to reevaluate. You know, so truly, start to have regular exams, develop a relationship with your uh, physician and your pharmacist if you are prescribed any medications because they will be able to help you to discuss or talk about certain things when you go get a prescription filled. You know, I had the opportunity to talk with one of my uh, pharmacists and gave me some information that I was able to take back to my primary care physician to question them on some things that was being prescribed. You know, so we have to get involved. So that diversity basically means, all right, it looks like we have a caller. Okay. Hello, caller. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you. So my question is, um, when you talk about advocating for yourself with a doctor, if yeah. you don't like the, the doctor's diagnosis or a recommended method of treatment, when do you seek a, a second opinion? Actually, as soon as you get a diagnosis that you feel is questionable, then I would encourage everybody to get a second opinion and possibly a third. I personally just went through a situation like that, and I had to go and talk to some physicians at another hospital, you know, because I know when you get in one particular network or one group, then they tend to collaborate and work as a team. So in order to get a different uh, second opinion, you may have to go outside of that particular medical group. And I would encourage you, as soon as you get a diagnosis that could be uh, life-threatening or unnerving to you, then it's always good to get a second opinion as soon as possible. Because unfortunately, with people of color, uh, we tend to wait too late um, to get things questioned or get things answered or to get things changed. And I have lost a lot of colleagues and friends because of that procrastination. So if you get a diagnosis today, then I encourage you to by next week, you should be talking to somebody else. You know, and that's basically what I did. I got a diagnosis of a condition that I really didn't feel that I had, but of course, my symptoms uh, demonstrated that. So that next week, I was over at Northwestern and one of the other physician's offices saying, look, man, this is what they said. What can we do? You know, and subsequently I got some good information that I was able to take back to my primary care doctor and then started a collaboration with them so that he could talk to these people from another network and get their recommendations. You know, so we kind of created a, a team, if you will. Okay? Uh, hopefully that answered your question, caller. All right. But now let's move on um, to some of the other... Uh, comments. Now, if you look at this particular slide, hopefully you guys can see it clearly, but what it talks about is what is health equity? Now, health equity is not equality, right? It's not about getting the same thing everybody else is getting. If you see the diagram, equality means everybody that's trying to see this particular um, sporting event, everybody get one box. Now, if you're shorter than the person next to you, you won't have the same view or you won't be able to see it at all. But if you look at the next picture where it says equity, the taller person has no box, the next person to him has one box, 
and the one that needs it has two boxes. So basically, that's what half equity basically is. And uh, in this illustration, it's letting you know that you should try to get what you need and not what they want to give you. Okay? And we have to do that through several fronts. I mentioned having a relationship with your physician, uh, with your pharmacist. And, of course, we have to talk to our legislators because a lot of times if we are on you know, private insurance, if we own Medicaid, Medicare, then a lot of these things is governed by certain policies that's being written in these legislative offices. So we need to be able to go down there, sit down and talk to our legislators and say, look, man, if you're working for me, this is what I need you to do. You know, and we need to start pushing that. I know we are going through some changes now uh, with this uh, managed care organization, or what we call MCOs. Uh, particularly around the Medicaid, or as they say, Obamacare, which is actually the Affordable Care Act. So we are now starting to revamp that. If you all been paying attention to the news, we know that we have an administration in the White House that's trying to repeal and replace everything that's been done in the previous administration. So we have to make sure that we advocate on all fronts to get what we need and not what they want to give us. Because as once again, as history has proven, people of color are being disproportionately impacted by every known illness that I mentioned, which is the diabetes, hypertension, you know, uh, hepatitis C, hepatitis B. And the next thing I want to talk about is this so-called opiate epidemic. We know that there's been some real chignery, if you will, uh, some sleight of the hand stuff going on. Um, and we know that we have a lot of pharmaceutical companies that's making millions of dollars on our illnesses and, of course, doing some things that are somewhat unethical. So we have some states in the U.S. that are actually targeting and suing these pharmaceutical companies because of their role in pushing these opiate pills and opiate medications and prescriptions that subsequently leads to what we now call an opiate epidemic. All right? So once again, advocating on all fronts, personally with your physician, uh, with your pharmacist, and then on a community level, make sure you talk to your families, you know, your family members, because all of us is dealing with something, right? And find out what's going on genetically in the family, and then we can start to rule some things out, right? And once you have identified that, then you can start to go and advocate for the legislation that's necessary so that we won't continue to be, what can I say, dictated to by some of these, I like to call them pirates, but I'm going to be nice, these um, insurance companies that will limit your care. Like I say, I've been doing substance abuse counseling for over 20 years, and I have never seen the conditions that I'm experiencing um, in the last year or so we're dealing with managed care, trying to get people into treatment that got legitimate problems. We know that addiction is a scourge on our community. It has been for a number of years. But now that it's starting to affect some other folk, now it's an epidemic. Okay, I can go with that. Everybody needs help sometime. But when you got people who don't know the clients and they looking at a book and they determined that based on the symptomatology, it don't meet their medical or their interpretation of medical necessity, then people wind up getting what they want to give them. We run a seven-day detox at the facility that I work with. Most hospitals run a three-day detox. They'll pay for a three-day detox at a higher rate as opposed to giving people seven days, which is, has a much more effective outcome because they don't deem that the medical... The information meets medical necessity, so they'll only approve three days. Okay. All right, so do we just accept it? Or do we go to our legislators and say, look, we need to figure out how to deal with these insurance companies so that we can get what we need and not what they want to give us. Okay? So let's look at the next slide. All right. Now, if you can see this slide, we're looking at what it really takes to make this health equity thing work. All right, it looks like we have another caller. All right, how you doing, caller? Mr. Pat, how are you? Oh, life is great, man. I'm truly trying to make a difference every day. 
Yeah, I see you lost some weight. <laughs> well, thank you. You are too kind. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm working on it. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm, when do you have a program on diabetes? Well, you know what? We're going to try to talk a little bit about that as well. Not specifically diabetes, but I will definitely put that in the... Um, in the framework, and me and the community epidemiologist, Sister Yah, will come up with a plan where we can highlight some of the current treatments and options for diabetics. All you know? right, so how's Sister Yah doing? Oh, man, she is phenomenal. She out there in the community uh, right now doing some community engagement work, you know, working with veterans. You know, so she's doing well. Yeah, you know who she is, right? I can't say I do. This your uncle. Uncle Joe? Yeah. <laughs> hey, all right, uh, well, it's good to hear from you, man. I got to get over there and see you. I know the last time you told Ed I was, yeah. I was reasoning by and you didn't see me. But, yeah, so we're going to work on the diabetes thing, though. Okay. All right? Hey, well, right. thanks for calling in, bro. All right. Sir. All right, man. I love you. Talk to you soon. All right. But, all right, so if you look at this particular slide, we're looking at the policy change. We're looking at program services, data and research, as well as some of the, what we call the institutional changes. We know that we done lost a couple of hospitals over the last few years. We know that we just came out of a two-year budget stalemate just a few months ago, which caused a lot of programs to either cut service or eliminate services. So as a community, we have to start to really pay attention to these particular things that's going on at a legislative level if we are going to make this work. We're going to have to continue to, as we say, to build community capacity. What does community capacity really mean? That means that we are going to, we are going to have to get out here, network with our families first, because that's, what, that's our first institutional learning and then start to go to our neighbors, and then branch out from there and go to the broader community, you know, where we can start to make sure that we educate people about the things that need to happen, give them the efficacy and the skills that they feel they need so that they can go out and be strong advocates for themselves, their families, children, grandparents, etc. We know that with all of the, the violence that's going on in Chicago, and I saw some, um, some data uh, a little while ago that was her horrifying to me. You know, when you think about all of the killings, that's one thing. You know, unfortunately, that's the undertaker's business. But when you think about the people that get injured that don't die and the cost that it takes to get them back together, get them stabilized, it is phenomenal. So we have to make sure that when we talk in policy, we talk in community capacity, that we have to get out here and work on every front to make sure that we are knowledgeable, that we are willing to do what it takes to fight for our children, our wives, our grandparents, you know, and make sure that we can get the services in our community that's necessary. Okay? Now... With that being said, I want, like I said, I want to talk a little bit about this opiate thing before I run out of time here. So we're going to look at our next slide. Now, this here, I don't know if you guys can read it, but it says the opiate epidemic has been affecting the U.S. since the early 2000s. We know it's been a little longer than that, but we're going to go with what the data say. And in two th according to CDC, in 2010, 1 in 20 people in the U.S. was reported using prescription painkillers. Now, did you hear me? Prescription painkillers. We ain't even talking about the stuff that's being sold on the street. Now, with just the prescription painkillers, and I know from my experience in working in this field, the last couple of years I've been seeing a lot of young people coming in that's been using these, uh, um, these Xanaxes. They've been using the um, Percocets. They've been using the oxycodone, the, um, the hydrocodone. And these are some very potent painkillers. You know, they go in, they get a fracture, you know, the doctor prescribes them these particular pills and subsequently don't talk about the addictive process that can occur as a result of using them. So when young people um, start using them and subsequently they can't get the prescriptions anymore, you know, then now they done got 
what can I say, a tolerance to this particular medication. So what do you do when your body starts hurting and you find out that you withdrawing from something and you really don't know how to deal with it? You go to the next best thing. So you go to the street and subsequently somebody will tell you, well, look, man, I can give you this dime bag of, uh, of heroin, you know, that'll take care of that oxycodone addiction, you know. And subsequently, this is what we see happening today, you know, where we have a lot of young people um, that's getting hung, getting strung out, because of their induction into this uh, opiate epidemic by way of painkillers or pharmaceutical drugs, okay? Now, I got some data for you that's specifically to Chicago. So we're going to look at that and have a brief conversation. And please, please call in. Uh, well, we got 312-738-1060. So please call in if you got any questions. All right. Now, oh, we, we, there we go. Okay, now if you all had a chance to see that slide, what we're looking at right here is in 2015, the opiate deaths, and this is just in Chicago, according to the you know, Healthy Chicago Epidemiology, uh, Epidemiological Report, Epidemiology Report. 2015, there were 426 deaths. Now this is heroin, primarily street pharmaceuticals, that's, that's been laced with this particular substance called fentanyl, which is a very potent painkiller. Um, and unfortunately, we've been seeing a lot of um, catastrophes with young people using this stuff and not knowing what they're getting. Okay, so once again, knowledge is truly the key to being free, and knowledge is power. Right? But in 2015, we had 426 deaths. So that was roughly about 15%. 15.5% of the using population. Look at the numbers for 2016. It jumped to 741 deaths. You know, that's a 74% increase overall in people that are dying from these particular drugs. So when you think about this particular exponentiation, this explosion, right, and you got to ask yourself, who's responsible? Is it the addict or the person that's addicted? Or is it the people that's peddling the products? Whether it be the street pharmacists or whether it be the pharmacists, you know, these pharmaceutical companies that's doing some of their shady marketing practices. All right, you know, we, we, can, we can toss that around. But the reality of it is that these are the numbers and we are losing a lot of people as a result of this so-called opiate epidemic, right? When you look at the age ranges, and between the age group of 15 to 24, in 2015, that was 27 deaths. Look at 2016, we talking 43 deaths. It almost doubled, all right? Now, and you look at the age group from 25 to 34, we talking 78 deaths in 2015. In 2016, it went up to 151, all right? Substantial increases. You know, and these are just people in Chicago. I'm not talking nationally, right? When you look, when you look at the overall scale, you know, we're talking from 15 to 74 years old. We didn't have, like I said, a 74 percent increase with these particular substances. So what I want to tell you guys, right? What I want to tell you is that we are truly in the midst of a serious stronghold. You know that we as individuals can break, but it's gonna take some work. It's gonna take us being out here advocating for ourselves, making sure that we get all of the right information, you know, cause people will sell you a bill of goods if you let them. But that's why we gotta do our research. If you notice, I keep a bunch of literature in front of me all the time. I've been doing this here for 25 years plus, truly by the grace of the Creator, and I'm employing you as a, as a citizen of this city, as a member of the human race, to get out here, do what you can, get the knowledge, and make sure we transfer that knowledge to our people. So with that being said, we are going to get ready to wrap this segment up. But I just want to kind of show you a couple of other slides real quick. Uh, 
Okay, this is our Health Equities campaign, uh, Black Unity, um, Umoja campaign. So I want you guys to take a part of that. Okay, and I'm getting my wrap up saying, so we're gonna have to do that. Okay. Um, and if you need some more information, you can call Sister Yah at 312-961-6189 if you want the data. And if you want to reach me and you got questions about counseling, you know somebody that needs some help, then 773-988-3411 and I will direct you to the right place to be to get the help you need. And with that, I want to thank you. Oh man, we are wrapping up. That is tax. All right.